So we are just beginning a series looking at Old Testament characters. We're going to look at five in total, and they're all from the book of Genesis. And we'll look at them on the basis that in the New Testament it says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, correcting, rebuking and training in righteousness. So we come to these scriptures knowing that they are God's word to us. As we look at the Old Testament, a lot of it is narrative about characters. And as we read their story, uh, we actually find they are incredibly relevant to our modern situation because they are about real lives in the real world. And so as we go through, we will find that we, we have something to say about the world as it is, uh, about a foundation for the gospel in Jesus Christ, uh, and something to say about God's views on today's issues. We're beginning with the life of Adam. Now, there's not time to give some detail or in-depth analysis or to deal with some of the key questions which will arise. And I want to encourage you to read Genesis chapters 1 through to end of 4, start of chapter 5 in your own time with the things I'm going to talk about today in view. There is a, uh, a sheet available with six different readings, short readings, you can do one a day or whatever works for you, in these chapters with some questions to help you think and engage with the material there. So, the life of Adam. Let's think about his life story recorded in these chapters. In chapter 2, he is formed by God from the dust of the earth and he's given a perfect environment with full provision and real meaning and responsibility in life to care for the garden, the world that God has made. He's given a wife to be with him, to support him, to help him, to work with him and be united with him. But in chapter 3, in this perfect world, Satan comes and tempts them to disobey God. Sadly, they fall, and the result of their disobedience is they are filled with fear and with shame. Have you experienced fear and shame in this world? So did Adam. And then they lose the benefits that they had of this garden as they are excluded from it. And they are to meet hard work and frustration in their daily lives. Do you encounter hard work, frustration, difficult to make ends meet or to have positive relationship with others? That's what Adam and Eve experienced after the fall. And then in chapter 4, we find they have three kids. The first one is, is a godly guy, Abel. And they lose this son to murder. The second, Cain, is an ungodly son. And he ends up, he leaves home, and he also leaves God. We read, he went out from the presence of God. Having lost those two sons, they have a third son. They have other kids as well, but these are the three recorded uh, for us and named. Third is Seth. And he too is a godly son from whom we are descended. And we read that with him, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And then lastly, in chapter 5, we find that death has become the new regime. As we read of different generations living, giving birth, and then dying. That's the life of Adam. And in it, we find he reflects the world as it is. As I look out on the world, I see a mix of good and bad. There's beautiful and there's ugly. Uh, and as we look out and see that, we, as we read Genesis, the first part of Genesis, 
we see that, crudely speaking, what is good comes from creation and from God and his perfection. And um, what is bad is the result of evil and the fall. As we look out at mankind, we also see this reflection of good and of evil. Everyone, you know, the very best people have some taint of badness, evil, unkindness within them. And the very worst also have some aspect of goodness. And that reflects the fact that we are made in the image of God, just like Adam was. But also, that image of God is damaged by sin and the fall. Also, as I encounter daily life, I find I'm faced with choices and temptations. It's part of our natural life. You know, we, just like they, found this beautiful tree in the middle of the garden, which God said they were not to eat the fruit of. But when they looked, it looked beautiful. They're tempted by the devil and they take it. And so we find in the middle of our garden, so to speak, are those things which we know actually are not going to be good and God said they're not good, but we're still inclined to take it. And when we've done so, we are filled with that same shame as they had. And we may even have some fear of approaching God. We then tend to pass the blame to others. We want to blame our circumstances or the people around us. And what we also find is there's often unintended consequences flowing from those decisions, even to future generations, just as there was for Adam and Eve. And lastly, in terms of the world as it is, the beauty we see in this story is about God's grace. You see, he gives man this perfect environment, not because he'd worked for it, he just gives it to him. And then when he sinned, and he still approaches Adam and Eve. He still comes to them. Although he detests sin, he still comes towards them and seeks to find them and speaks to them. He starts, initiates the conversation. And then on top of that, Adam and Eve, they feel shame at their nakedness. They've attempted to make some clothes, but they're not really that good. God makes for them some much better clothes to hide their shame and their guilt. And then on top of that, when we read the story of Cain, he murders Abel. And yet God, in his grace, he says he puts a mark of protection on Cain so that others might not kill him. Even the murderer, God shows grace towards in these very first chapters. That's the world as it is. What we also find in these chapters is a foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. To fully understand what Jesus Christ has done and the importance of it, we have to come back to this introduction to the world that God's made. You see, Adam was made in the image of God, but he passed on to Seth, his son, his own image, which included a propensity to sin and that damaged image that came from God. And so for us, we have the same problem today, that propensity to sin. And the truth of the matter is, is that sin is the main problem. In chapter 4 of Genesis, God says to Cain, as he's filled with jealousy, but before he commits murder, he says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you, but you must master it. And we see in Jesus Christ a power which otherwise we do not have. That power to master and overcome sin rather than it have power over us. Jesus Christ came to bring forgiveness, setting us free from past guilt and sin. And he also came to bring a power in his name, an authority in his name, the Holy Spirit within us to enable us to set aside temptation in our lives. Behind every problem is actually the problem of sin. And Jesus is the answer to it. Everything else is a sticking plaster, however good that sticking plaster might be. Finally, in terms of foundation for the gospel, 
the New Testament sees Jesus as a second Adam. Second Adam was a, first Adam was a, a kind of a new race, a new opportunity, new creation. Jesus Christ brings another new creation. He creates us anew from within. And whereas the first Adam brought sin and death, Jesus Christ brings forgiveness and life. And you can read about it in Romans chapter 5. And then lastly, in these chapters is adopting God's views on today's issues. We've seen how relevant uh, this passage is to today. And we see something of what God is saying about current situations. First of all is racial relations. We read in these chapters that we are one race, one race from Adam and Eve. We have a common image of God in each one of us, but we are also each fallen. And so we must fully accept one another as brothers and sisters, coming ultimately from God with a fallen nature. Secondly, is the issue of identity. Such a big issue as people seek out their identity in today's world and try to make their own identity. In these chapters, we see that fundamentally, us as humans are made in the image of God and it is in him that we find our identity. The reality is too that we are fallen, but each of us as fallen people have the potential to be raised up in Christ and fully restored to how God intended us to be. Therefore, each of us has intrinsic value and real purpose in life. You do, just as your next door neighbour does. And then thirdly, in our times, a sensitive issue, the issue of sexuality. When Jesus Christ is asked a question about marriage and divorce, he comes back to these first few chapters of Genesis. And he quotes from Genesis 1 to start with. He says to them, have you not heard, have you not read, that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And then he moves on to marriage, quoting from Genesis 2, that a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two become one flesh. Jesus appeals to this creation teaching before the fall. Later he says that anything else was because your hearts were hardened. And so we need to recognise that actually, Anything else is the impact of the fall in our lives. Now that does not mean or undo what I've already spoken about, about us being made in the image of God and about our common heritage and connection together. It means we accept one another, we accept one another as being made in the image of God and being part of a one human race together. It also means that however we feel in these things, actually our identity is ultimately to be found in being in the image of God. And it also means that for each of us we have intrinsic value and our purpose is ultimately to be found in Christ, as is our true potential. So we're not called to judge one another, but we are called to reflect God's image. And then lastly is that sin is the real problem in today's society. And sin is an internal problem with external consequences. As Jesus highlights, it's a problem of the human heart which flows out in words and in action. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. All this evil is the result of the fall and the evil one. But Jesus came to destroy his works and to bring life in all its fullness, which is a life of love and joy and peace for all who follow him. So I want to encourage you to study these chapters, Genesis chapters 1 to 4, the life of Adam. 
And as you do so, think about how it reflects the world as it is, both good and bad, us being made in the image of God and us falling. Think about how it sets the tone for the foundation of the gospel, the massive problem of sin and that Jesus is the answer to it. And then lastly is look at God's views as he looks at society in terms of our race together, our identity, our sexuality and the problem of sin. If you want help in doing that then I do have a leaflet which simply gives small readings um, and a few questions to think about against each one. Contact me to have them supplied to you.